what had it, what was balanced racially, but because of class, I had more in common with the predominantly white part of the of the school, but I was also obviously because of race had more in common with the um, predominantly black and Latino um, students who lived in the project right by the school. And uh, when we moved to Porchester, my parents thought it was a good idea to put me in the best school, so they found the best public school in that area and went and did interviews with the teachers in various places without me and figured out where the best place for me to go to, to school was and, 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 and put me there. So I think in that moment I was, I had to, you know, and they went and had talks with the principal, you know, to, to figure out what the culture of the school was going to be, whether I was going to be ostracized or whether I was going to be accepted and whether the principals and the, the uh, teachers were going to be on my side. And, and uh, I thank them for that exploration. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Um, I was just going to say, so I'm from Tucson, Arizona, which is, One you know, of the most racially progressive states. Exactly, <laughs> Arizona. <laughs> Woohoo! Oh yeah, so progressive. So like, musical desert, like cultural kind of desert, and just where <laughs> the, the, the city was not particularly, you know, embracing of other type people, be they Negro, be they Latino, whatever it was, if you're different, it was always weird. But, you know, my parents, and knowing that, because my mother's born and raised in Tucson also, and my dad went to Tucson for college, um, you know, we were always in uh, Jack and Jill and Lynx, and like all of the, the things where there were three black people, we were there, because it was like trying to all be together. And it was, it was um, because, you know, because we, we were, you know, middle class, and we, we were well off enough to be able to make service our main thing. You know, it was like, all we did was, you know, it was like, always doing some service project, some sort of like giving back. And that's kind of, I mean, that's partly why I have a full-time job, so that I can have enough money to do all this kind of support. You and were raised, right? I was raised. That's what I mean. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so it's kind of like, you know, what you have, you give back, whether that's, you know, whatever. So I think that, it, and it's because I grew up in Tucson, where that wasn't a cultural thing. It had to be a family thing. And um, also because, you know, it was really just me and my brother, mother, and father. All the other relatives were Florida or California. So it was kind of like we had to create that community um, for ourselves in Tucson. So, you know, that helped in, in making it insular actually helped, you know, see a bigger picture, which was kind of cool. And that, you know, it pulled over into music because whenever there were black people on TV, because, you know, they, there were no concerts. You know, New Edition came like eight times, but that was it. You know, they were like the only people who came touring through Tucson. So it was kind of like, you got what you got. And, um, you know, radio and, you know, at, at the time, of course, I, I grew up in the 80s. So it was like, you would hear New Edition and you would hear. And then when Prince came, hallelujah, thank God, you know. Oh, you know, um, Living Color was like, yes, hallelujah. Thank so then it was like he started to gravitate toward those things. But, you know, otherwise it was kind of like, okay, me and my people, what can we do to, you know, change things? Well, I really want to kind of talk about uh, now everybody's kind of rock and roll conversion moments, but I really uh, also want to maybe proceed that by just asking you guys when you realized that um, when you realized that there was a conversation going on around race and music in America, that that was kind of a, a bellwether for folks or an obsession or a problem for folks. Yeah, I can tell you something about that. Hello? Yeah. Uh, well, I was playing, and, uh, you know, I was, uh, I had some uh, uh, beginning beginning experiences uh, Spaceships and space in the mid-60s where I, you know, I met Sonny Rollins, uh, 
Sonny and I eventually did something together where he uh, uh, he played. Uh, we did a TV show, and he played on the on one of my songs, uh, and it was amazing because he he uh, he was in my band for that song, you know. And then when the solo time came out, he played the solo. It was remarkable. It was remarkable to see that. And then, on the same show, I did a duet with Carmen McRae, uh, who was a distant relative of mine. Uh, and it was the same sort of thing. Uh, I'm singing uh, Teach Me Tonight uh, with her. And she's taken me to school. It's fantastic, you know. And she's, but she's so kind about it as we do the song on, on TV. And, uh, uh, so, I mean, that's an example for me of the countless, many experiences I've had that have led me, that have kind of lifted me up along the way. I knew Mingus back at, uh, you know, uh, on St. Mark's Place. We see him all the time. Uh, uh, in, high, in, in, in Syracuse, where I went, I, I met Lou Reed. Lou Reed is uh, one of my closest friends for 50 years. We met back in 19... Uh, 61, I guess it was. And Lou, you know, obviously he had a real bag of tricks with him, what he did. And uh, that was definitely an influence. My biggest influence was Frankie Lyman. Frankie Lyman was my, uh, I was just uh, in love with what he was about. He was my size. Uh, you know, I, I wanted to. I wanted to be like him. I thought I was him. I, you know, I, I tried to sing like him. I, you know, I'm not in no it all. That, like that's Frankie Lyman. You know? And I and I, uh, you know, I revered him. And uh, I had these little. I had these great things that happened along the way that kept me going. You know. Uh, uh, and the same thing when it came time to be playing and trying to get a record contract, that's a whole other thing. But uh, a guy from uh, Atlantic Records came down to see me in a club, like old school approach, saw me play, and asked me if I wanted to come and sign with Atlantic. You know? It wasn't the best record deal in the world. But it wasn't about that, was it? It's, it's never about that. It's about this record deal is this, and then you got to go to the next record deal is that, and then the next record. Except that now things are a lot different. I think they're very different. Uh, but I'll just say that uh, I was I persevered. I continued no matter what. I fell on my face and I kept going. I just kept. Going. I was, I was lucky I must, I, my, my family gave it to me, that's what I think, that's what I really think happened. And, and I just, I would never stop, just like now, I'll be, I'll be, uh, I'll be 70 in, a, in, a, in another month. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> yes, the big 7-0, and uh, I'll be playing at the High Line, you better come, very few, <laughs> ticket, very few tickets left. Uh, and I plan to be around for another 17 years. You know, I, oh wow, I, okay, 20, let's make it 20. I'll be around for another 20. Years. I've been blessed. Oh, the question, I, I remember the question. So rock and roll, dividing line. So, um, you know, like I said, I was raised in a Christian fundamentalist kind of bubble from, uh, so, you know, my earliest, my earliest, another early childhood member, memory of just rock and roll was, was Fleetwood Mac on the beach in, in Chicago. And that was kind of like my only rock and roll memory after five years old. It was like Stevie Nicks, love you. And now we're in. Now, now we're inside the. Um, and somehow my mom decided that. I mean, it was like we went through and like 
We threw out all the records. I had to throw away my Greece record. I had to throw away anything that was like, could be even slightly construed as satanic. Um, I was just like so intense. It's like, this is satanic. Your Greece record is satanic. Satan's involved. 